Welcome to Conscious Conversations. Um, this is a place to explore people living conscious, authentic, and meaningful lives and looking at what that really means for them um, and then exploring their story, their framework, and the tools that they're using to stay on that path. I think that's really important. We can learn so much from people from what they're doing and how they're living authentically to themselves. My name's Luke McLean, and I'm a mindfulness-based life coach where I work with people from all spectrums, whether it's you know improving performance, to someone that's in a challenging or a stressful situation, just using mindfulness as the foundation to help people be better. And I think that's really important. I'm also a father of five, so I'm, I'm with you and I'm understanding the busyness and the stress. I'm not immune from that at all, but I, you know, I understanding it, be more self-aware and building a better relationship to it helps me, but it can also help other people. I'm also the health and wellbeing manager at the Cotton On Group, and I've been fortunate enough over the last nine years to build their health and wellbeing program pretty much from scratch. And what I think now is a really world-class program, but what's been more important for me is to be able to work in the, the wellness, mindfulness, and leadership space and learn from the best leaders within you know a global organization and pull together some amazing tools that have, have been helpful for other people. If you'd like to know a little bit more about me, you can check me out at ecolifecoaching.net. My Instagram tag is ecolife and mindfulness. Um, if you like the show, make sure you give me a shout out. A review on iTunes would be awesome and just tell some people about it. But without further ado, welcome to Conscious Conversations. You've been waiting around long enough. The moment is here and you better stand up. This week we got a really cool episode. Um, I really dig this episode. It was one that I got more involved with because it was so aligned to my values. But, you know, James McConnell, he was the strength and conditioning coach for the AFL women's Bulldogs team. They won the premiership this year, so he played a huge role in that. He um, he's, a, he's a movement expert. You know, he's done a lot of study around functional movement, how to move well, how to move pain-free. And he works a lot with people now on reducing pain through movement and works and connecting the brain to the body to basically how we live and try to create a more whole human. He's a huge environmentalist and a guy that's just started a t-shirt label called Sensory Imprint. They basically do really cool, organic, eco-friendly cotton tees, which then 50% of what you raise goes back to a charity, which is around environmental and and around animal rescue and that type of thing. It's a good, good conversation, one I hope you enjoy. We go into many layers, different levels, um, the trajectory of the conversation is quite high. So if you want to think a little bit different, you want to sort of get that feeling, this is a good conversation to, to just whack in the car and let the mind run free. So welcome, Jimmy McConnell, to Conscious Conversations. It's time. Okay, today we've got James McConnell. Uh, James wears many hats uh, around the, the wellness uh, environmental space, and I like the way that Jimmy sort of holds both those tensions between, you know, natural movement, um, you know, helping people move better, which is absolutely necessary. And also, you know, just that environmental impact, our carbon footprint and how we live, you know, more connected to nature and, and a simpler life, which I think is really important. And I think what James is doing and really working towards doing it is merging both that you've got this ability that we do need to move and move well um, because we do sit so much and the, when we do connect deeply and more authentically with nature that we are we will move better as well so there's definitely synergy in, in those those areas that he looks at so James mate welcome to the podcast it's good to have you on thanks for having us Luke appreciate it uh I want to start with where this sort of this journey began around around movement initially, and sort of you know there's a lot of people that get into the the fitness industry, the fitness space, um, and want to be a real generalist. Um, but you've found a, a real niche in what you do um, and your training styles. You know it's quite unique um, to get the outcomes you want. So where where'd that kick off, mate? Um, like most kids, I finished high school and was like, I really have no idea what I want to do. Had a massive passion for sport and music. Figured sport was something that potentially was going to give me more option for work in the future. So I followed that 
And about 2010, which would have been my second year of uni, um, I discovered the functional movement system or functional movement screen and traveled around up to Sydney, learned that. It was the second time they'd come to Australia from the US and pretty much that kicked off all my movement stuff. Like figured out, look, watch people move. How can you make them move better? And then how can we train them so they're not in pain? And it's just progressed from there through plenty of travel discovering more and more courses, more and more things to learn. And ultimately it's ended up that I have a huge passion for the brain and that's where everything today pretty much evolves from. Right. So, okay. So we've stepped ahead a bit because we've gone from movement, which Mm -hmm. is, which is body. And most people or everyone basically thinks that movement's all about the body and there's some connection, but very little to the brain. Um, And it's a body fix. Um, that's why we go and get massages and all that sort of stuff when we're sore yep. and we want to just create little micro pockets of fixing and alleviating in short term. Um, can you explain in a bit more detail what that system of movement looks like in terms of, of you know, in a, in a really easy to know, but how do you best describe it if you're going to talk to a client about it? Mm, that is definitely a tough question. Um, if I'm talking to someone about movement, I sort of explain to them that Uh, All that we are is brain derived and our brain has the ability to adjust how our body moves based on pain, based on fear, based on a past response and based on something that we habitually do and to be able to change how I move or how I make someone else move I have to explain to them that everything you do is a brain response and it comes down to that you have patterns and we need to change those patterns. So if I was to say to someone let's work on um any form of strength exercise, it becomes a, a motor pattern. They need to learn that motor pattern. At the start, they're, that, that cognitive athlete, they're sort of learning it. It's really simple. And as they get better and better, it becomes that autonomous and that habitual pattern. And you look at most people that we do, that we work with, they, they sit all day. So it becomes habitual. So it comes down to giving them cues and giving their brain cues to go, okay, this is important. I probably need to change. Um, so that's pretty much how I approach it with most people. But they all have a pattern and we need to change it. It's not necessarily going, sure, your shoulder is sore, but why is it sore? What pattern do I need to move or need to change or need to make you become aware of to then change that pattern and take you out of pain or take you out of fear or so on and so forth? Yeah. And I think what people don't realize or sort of connect consciously a lot on it is the fact that the seating pattern um you're creating a pattern within that that's quite strong and quiet and, and then connecting that to how we culturally live these days and the amount of time we spend sitting and spend indoors, that that creates a new normal and then that creates an element of discomfort because the body's actually not designed to do that. Yeah, I agree. I use this one with habitual patterns a lot. People are like, oh, yeah, my back So I'm like, yeah, what do you do all day? You sit at your desk for argument eight hours, you drive to work, hour depending on the traffic in melbourne or if you're coming from melbourne to geelong what do you do when you go home you sit when you eat you sit when you watch tv you're probably sitting for a good 15 hours a day minimum so therefore we've got these same patterns that just end up happening all the time and as as soon as we have a conversation with someone our awesome posture goes out the door because we're not conscious of the posture we're conscious of the conversation So it's been able to explain to people that this is why your pattern will take so long to fix or will take longer than one quick visit to a massage therapist or a chiro. It's going to take a period of time. As soon as I explain to them, they're like, wow, that makes sense. Like I sit for 15 hours a day times that by seven days a week times that by however many years they've been sitting in the same job and they expect to be out of pain in one or two sessions. So it's it's almost like a, a nice little cycle. Um, and, and sure, like going and seeing a chiro or myo may help for one session, but it hasn't changed that pattern in the brain. It's still there. So yeah. that's the bulk, bulk of my job is trying to fix that. And we want the quick fix. Of course like we do. Everyone yeah. wants the quick fix. Quick fix. Um, and we also want to sit a lot. And we want to yeah. sit at a very unhealthy but comfortable state where chairs recline more and we can slouch. And, and it's around making life as easy as we can yep but that's as you're saying it comes at a cost 100 percent, it comes at a cost and gone is the art of sitting in a full squat like we see some of our eastern european and asian counterparts do they sit there all the time that's their natural working position um we've lost that in western society and there's a lot of people that are starting to bring that back in but it's a slow process and a lot of people can't even hit a full squat for 
30 seconds to rest and hang out that's very uncomfortable for them or certain parts of their body have switched off and they almost fall over when they're full squat it's just what you're saying jimmy is it around just the continuing you know almost like micro practices and, and the continuation on just getting the brain to get in that position more regularly that's gonna you know create the change or is it a a full-on dedicated 45 minutes three times a week to to functional movement like what's the best way to hit it there's always various thoughts but my thoughts are based on what i know about habitual patterns in the brain is that more of less so if i give someone as you said sort of that three um three sessions for 45 minutes a week the brain goes yeah this is important but it's not really going to change over long term because it's a habit where if I say to someone, here's two exercises, I want you to do it six times a day for maybe two minutes. I'm getting 12 minutes a day times that by my seven, I'm getting 96 um, sort of minutes in a week broken over all these little sections. And my brain goes, wow, this is important. I'm doing it so much, like sitting, I'm doing it so much. It must be important, so I must change and hopefully that change sticks. So that's that's my thought and that's why I think it's something that you can give people an exercise that they can do at their desk. Yeah. Or you can give them something that's not going to be the most monotonous or boring exercise that they have to go to the gym and spend 25 minutes to set up something and, and change it around and find the weights. If it's super simple, they can do it. And the brain remembers it pretty quickly if you do it regularly. Yeah. And I, I love it. I love because the stuff that you do and the stuff that you really believe in doesn't require the fancy equipment, a lot of it, and it doesn't require... Even getting changed into the right outfits, if you're only going to do a little four or five minute hit regularly, you can do that at your desk or you can do it at home. I know that you know I try to set the uh, the timer to get me off the couch and get into a different position and, and practice that, like just to, the reminder yep. of doing yep. that. Um, but that's not sexy, <laughs> and I think that's the bit that you, you can struggle with is it's not a shiny piece of equipment and it's not the equipment that's going to fix you. It's you that are going to fix you. Yep, I completely agree. And unfortunately, a lot of our culture is about doing something that is, is sexy and showing other people that you're doing something. It's not doing a little drill at your desk that's going to make your shoulder move a bit better. Or if we delve a little bit deeper, it's not doing a pencil push-up or a convergence exercise that's going to make one eye function better. But that's the stuff that makes you in pain or out of pain. It's yeah. It's not about going and smashing yourself in the gym because that would be called, you know, that's like, that's like a, a workout, you know. We're, we're training in life. It's something that you should be able to do all the time and it's that's why I use the word drill as opposed to exercise. We're doing this little drill. I want you to incorporate this three times a day, four times a day as opposed to this is an exercise because you say the word exercise, people are like, oh, it's going to be hard. It's going to yeah. be monotonous. It's going to be boring. It's, it's whatever. Yeah. And it seems, you know absolutely needed but quite ironic that we are actually having to train people to move um when i've got little kids in the house and i watch them squat and move and they move absolutely perfectly their squats are amazing and they'll sit there as you said all day and be completely comfortable and yet when we sort of shift away from that with technology and with devices that are taking our attention it's becoming more and more yeah. needed Yep, definitely. You look at child development, like there's kids up until like, till they start school, they move so well. And then we throw them in, but all they want to do as a five-year-old is run around and do stuff with their imaginary friends or play with their mates that's just unscripted, it's play. And then we get them to a five-year-old and they go, okay, now you're five, you've got to start learning some stuff, which they're probably going to develop playing with their friends anyway, but we throw them in a classroom, they have to sit for six hours a day, and they only get to run around for an hour at lunchtime. Of course, we get kids that misbehave and we get the so-called ADD or whatever you want to call. But if you're sitting for six hours a day at a five-year-old, and all of a sudden you get to 30 and you've been doing it for 25 years, there's that pattern again that we've already spoken about. So, yeah, people lose it. They lose that ability to move and they you know, lose the ability to probably play, which is another one that's well, very yeah. important. So. Let's touch on that because I find it absolutely... It blows my mind with what what's going on in that in that realm in terms of that they do only get forty five minutes to an hour to to play. Um, that you're throwing in a smartphone that every second kid's got, even at seven or eight, have got that they want to be on their phone rather than play. Um, and then you get into sort of high school where there's actually, you know high school don't have playgrounds. 
Like high school was, you don't play at high school. At your lunchtime, you just sit around and talk, and there's actually nowhere to play. 